At what point does sin actually become sin? Is it only once we've thoroughly crossed the threshold into the realm of outward behaviors and actions? Or, in biblical terms, can a person be in sin merely at the level of desire? John Owen says that we should make no provisions for the flesh, that sins of omission can quickly become sins of commission. This is the subject we'll be addressing in today's episode of Theology Applied. I'm welcoming onto the show for the first time, Dr. Jared Moore. I'm Pastor Joel Webin, your host with Right Response Ministries. Let's tune in now. Applying God's Word to every aspect of life. This is Theology Applied. All right, welcome to another episode of Theology Applied. I'm your host, Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries. And in this episode, I'm privileged to welcome to the show for the first time, Dr. Jared Moore. Are we a doctor over there? Yes, sir. All right, great. Jared, thanks for coming on the show. You've just written a book called The Lust of the Flesh. And go ahead and flesh out also, flesh out, but uh, flesh out the subtitle for the book, because that'll probably get the conversation going. It's The Lust of the Flesh, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, thinking biblically about sexual orientation, attraction, and temptation. So are you a big fan of Revoice, I imagine? No, not at all. Not <laughs> so, at all. So talk about that. So thinking biblically about orientation, attraction, and temptation. Because it seems like part of what you're getting into is the you know concupiscence, the, just the, the doctrine of sin. How do we understand sin? When does a, a desire become sin or is desire itself sinful? It's, it's a really important conversation because it, it does seem like the church has been wrestling for several decades now, especially with all the LGBT stuff, uh, that the church has been working overtime to redefine sin. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, Wesley Hill came on the scene and Almost Revoice's entire argument is almost rhetoric. That's all it is. It's the they they frame the argument in such a way that it it's empty rhetoric. But Christians were not biblically confessional enough to be able to resist the onslaught. I'm I'm talking. It, it's amazing. It, it's it, it's crazy that Revoice got such a foothold in the. PCA because they have the most robust confession. Um, you know, the Westminster standards are totally against Revoice. And um, so Revoice argues you've got Nate Collins, the president of Revoice, and the, it's called Side B Christianity is what they call it. But it's just they're, they're gay Christians, but when they say gay, they mean that they – have same-sex desires, and they reject the same-sex sexual desires, but they believe that there are non-sexual elements of their same-sex attraction that they can turn to holiness. Mm. And so they run around calling themselves a gay Christian um, because they believe they can sanctify their homosexual homosexual desires. And I argue in this book that, that you can't because the source – of same-sex desires is the fall or the flesh, and nothing good can come from the flesh, according to Romans 7. Um, Jesus says that nothing good comes from the flesh, you know. but they believe that good can come from the flesh. Hmm. And so that's what I'm rebutting, is, is going back to Scripture and going back to the Reformed tradition, really the Protestant tradition entirely, even... Re- not not just the Protestant, but the Roman Catholic tradition before the 1700s mm. argued against this before they before they were semi Pelagian. Mm. Okay, um, so you're arguing that you know for a little while as we started as the church started dealing with again all the LGBT LMNOP madness. Um, that was one of the big questions. Is uh, what what is God's ideal uh, for someone who uh, wrestles with same tr- sex attraction? Is it that they merely not act on it, or that the desire itself would be purged? Right. That that if I'm not acting on this desire, uh, is um, is that enough? Is that sufficient? Um, am I am I living in full obedience to the law of God, or uh, by by having the desire but merely not acting on it? 
And this gets in, right, to the, the doctrine of concupiscence. Could you maybe just talk about that a little bit? What, how would you define concupiscence? So concupiscence is anything in you that's contrary to God, basically. It's original sin, but in Christians, it's what's left over of original sin. And so, you know, in unbelievers, original sin produces motions, and that that's concupiscence. Mm. In Christians, original sin has lost its foothold, but it still produces desires that we must turn from and seek to starve. You know, Augustine says that you treat it like it's a hot coal. You starve it and let it burn to no effect. And that the goal, Augustine also argued that the goal is sinlessness. He, he argued that the flesh is sin and anything that comes from it is sin. And so let's say that you have an inclination that's contrary to God. Um, and let's say you reject it. Augustine says, rejoice that you rejected it, but then repent for having even had it. The, the initial and, inclination to have, yeah, and, have and re, the desire re-voice. to sin against God, even if you didn't um, act on that desire, but just the fact that you had a desire to rebel against God in the first place. Yes. And folks, what they do is, what Revoice has done is they've reversed theology to where they study their feelings and then they read their feelings back into Scripture. You also see this with Gregory Coles, who just debated James White on this subject um, last week. You know, he, he argues that there is a pre-lust desire that is not sin. Hmm. But that is not according to the Protestant tradition and the Roman Catholic tradition, because he, he's basing sin on man's will, man's choices, rather than on God's definition of holiness. Hmm. So you see, the question of sin is not, oh, I've got to look in the mirror and do introspection and see if I've sinned. The question is, have I been obedient to God from my heart? And if you haven't been, that's sin. Right. Um, you know, I think of even the ways that this would apply. I know that you're primarily dealing with sexual immorality, but I think of the ways that it would apply even to, I, you know, I always think of um, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I feel that, like mm-hmm. in some way, uh, alcohol is deified; that it's given more power um, than than it should, right? So there's this sense of like um, forever, perpetually, you know, um, labeling yourself as, you know, hi, my name is Joel. I'm an alcoholic, um, mm-hmm. even if you know. And then it's like it's been 20 years since my last drink, you know. But it, you're still saying like, but I am this kind of person. Like, I mm-hmm. there's a certain strain of person, a certain identity, a cer- certain type of person, and I am that type of person. And so for me. Um, alcohol is a god. It has a supernatural deified power over me. I cannot even have one drop, right? When I attend church, you know, um, if that church uses wine in the Lord's Supper, I'm going to be that thorn in that pastor's side. Um, I'm going to, you know, the tyranny of the weaker brother. Here I, here I come. And, um, and we know those people, right? Uh, they, they're, you mm-hmm. know, dime a dozen, um, especially in the church. And so I, I think of like that same, it seems like a very similar principle with the revoice stuff when it comes to same sex attraction um, that, you know, well, this is just who I am. It's the way I was made even, you know, it's my design. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it seems like if you're not careful, you start to attribute uh, the same sex desire to, to God himself. Like God instilled this in me. Uh, God made me like this. Mm-hmm. Um or, or at, at minimum, you're, you're, it's a subtle indictment of, of the Creator as capricious or cruel that, uh, that, in, that he, you know, he gives and then with the next hand takes away. You know, that, he, that he creates you to uh, inherently desire something that uh, he conveniently forbid. Um, it, I, so, it, I mean, it messes with your doctrine of God. All these different things come into play. Mm-hmm. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and Nate Collins, for example... You know, the president of Revoice, he argues in his book, All But Invisible, he permits that people may be gay in eternity, in heaven, that they still, because, and I mean, that's that's the consistent argument, right? If you believe that um, same-sex attraction is not inherently sin, um, then the consistent outworking of that would say, well, why wouldn't it be in heaven? Right. They they refer to it as um, Wesley Hill says it's a doorway to blessing and grace. Um, you know, I mean, just how they it's all rhetoric and it's all introspection. Didn't they have like an article a while back, like what queer treasures will be in the new Jerusalem or something like that? 
Yeah, yeah. One of the uh, the worship leader at one of the first conferences argued that, and he since then he has come out as fully affirming of same sex marriage. Shocking. Yeah, shocking, right? <laughs> like it, it, it's ridiculous how, and it, you know, in that debate with James White and Gregory Coles, Coles said, which is it just it hurt my heart when he said it because he actually. Um, no, it wasn't. It's from his book. It's from his book that he wrote, which D. A. Carson endorsed, which which was shocking. Um, but uh, but he wrote a book, and he talked about at one point he was seeing this girl, and he thought, you know, she's the one. But he had this vision of Jesus, or a vision or a, a dream or or something, and Jesus was shaking his head at him like, no you're not supposed to marry this girl. And so he went and met with her and said no. And so now he says he's a gay celibate Christian. And I was just like, dude, yeah. <laughs> you found a girl that would marry you, number one, mm-hmm. which is hard, right, Joel? Like, right. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's not easy. And you turned her down because you're you're gay? Who told you you were gay? Right. The Bible sure didn't tell you right. what your experience tells you. Does your experience ever tell you that you're worthless and not valuable and not all kinds of things that are contrary to God? Right. We don't believe those things. Why? Because of the Bible. Well, why would we believe? Why would they believe because of they have these desires that those desires are who they are according to God's design when the Bible says the opposite? Finally, a coffee company that doesn't hate you and your beliefs. Today's sponsor, Squirrely Joe's Coffee, is a thoroughly Christian company that ships seriously good coffee straight to your front door. Owned and operated by Joe Morris and his family out of Olney, Illinois. They believe that Christians should be building a thoroughly Christian economy by doing business with other like-minded Christians. They also donate a portion of their proceeds to Operation Underground Railroad to help end child trafficking. Just go to squirrelyjoes.com and use promo code RRM for 20% off your purchase. Squirrely Joe's Coffee, share coffee, serve humbly, live faithfully. Join Douglas Wilson, Dr. Joseph Boot, Brian Sauvey, Eric Kahn, and myself on March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd for our 2024 conference. It's called Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. Go and visit rightresponseconference.com to register today. We hope to see you at the conference in March. Right. Yeah, it, it seems weird to me because some of this is just explicitly addressed by Scripture. So I think of the book of James. Like, why, why is it that you have quarrels and factions among you? Is it not because of your evil desires that are at war within you? You know, you um, you covet and do not have, so you commit murder. Um, and, and and I mean, even from like a, a law of God perspective, when it comes to you know the distinction between sins and crimes, as we're thinking about you know. Uh, political theology, which is a popular topic these days, you know, Christian nationalism and those kinds of things. Um, well, yeah, I, I don't want the civil magistrate to um, to form, you know, like we have enough uh, three letter agencies already. I'd like to get rid of them. I don't want um, the, you know, the coveting police, T, you know, TCP, you know, like um, th- because co- covetousness is like, well, then when does the civil magistrate punish covetousness? Well, when when it overflows from covetousness, unrepentant, unchecked, into theft, into murder, into you know that's what uh, that's what James is saying. But that's as it pertains to crimes and the role of the civil magistrate. Uh, that's not in regard. James is not making an argument in regards to sin. So it's not mm-hmm. uh, coveting is not sin. But once it uh, elevates to the level of murder or theft, then it becomes a sin. Um, no, uh, it's, you know, because, because that's the argument from, you know, desire gives uh, birth to sin, sin w- when fully grown leads towards, uh, leads towards death. And so um, I, I think, in my understanding, the book of James, it seems to be plainly saying that sin begins at the level of desire itself, that to desire anything outside of God's law um, is, uh, to miss the mark. Um, it is, you know, and certainly there are degrees. I think part of the problem is people are hesitant to call that a sin because, um, they're still operating underneath the misnomer that, uh, you know, all sin is equal and all sin is not equal. You know, like it's, I mean, it's much worse if you murder someone, uh, rather than, you know, merely covet 
their stuff. And so, uh, but it is sin. So we're not saying that, you know, that all sin is equal, um, that it's the worst sin, uh, but to say that it's not a sin at all, I think just invites a, a whole, it imposes on the scripture a weird hermeneutic and it invites a whole new host of problems. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Yeah, if you if you read the whole book of James, there's no way you can come away saying, you know, he really wanted his hearers to not feel bad about their desires. Right. <laughs> I mean, you you can't you can't argue that. Like he he's very direct, very blunt, and he starts that you know that passage in James one where you know people argue, see, only if desire conceives does it produce sin. They argue that, but they. James begins by saying that God can't tempt. He begins by saying God can't do this. Right. And what follows is, just as God can't do this because it's sin, what follows is a genealogical metaphor where you have a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter. And people take that metaphor and they say, well, sin doesn't come until you know desire conceives. But the problem is, is that that desire, just like a grandmother can only produce what she is, right? and a mother can only produce what she is. I mean, that's what he's arguing. He's saying this doesn't come from God. It comes from you, right? And he uses the same Greek word. The same Greek word can be translated tests, trials, or temptations. Mm. And in James 1, it's, it's translated all three of those. And tests and trials are the same thing. Um, but God can't tempt. So he argues, you know, count, you know, be be glad when you have these things because God is tests and trials are good for you because it matures you. But in the midst of your tests and trials from God, you tempt yourself toward evil. Mm. So he's trying to get these hearers to take responsibility for their sin from the root all the way to the fruit, not just not just the actions that they're right. responsible for, but even the evil desires. Right. And well, I, and it just seems silly because it's like, how would you get rid of the fruit? Like in every other instance, as we you know use that analogy of you know that that paradigm of root and fruit, and every other sermon I've ever heard, you know, uh, uh, using that same paradigm of root and fruit applied to any other topic, we would always say, well, you, you control the fruit by the root. Address the root. Address the root. You know, you think of like you know John Owen, you know, making no provisions for the flesh. You know, or sins of omission. You know, can become sins of commission. You know, and so like you. What do you do? You well, you you have to head it off at the root. You got to attack the root, and then that begs the question that if okay, if the way that I um, that I put to death, not just managing or subduing, but actually mortifying the flesh, mortifying sin, um, if if the way that I am to mortify uh, the fruit sins, uh, well, how do I do that? Well, I'm going to have to make war um, against the root, and then if I'm making war against the root. Then how do I say like what theological category would I use to say that I that God is calling me to war against something that's that's perfectly fine, something that's Amen. not sin? You know what I mean? So like I just feel like that mm-hmm. like James is saying cut this off over here, and he's he's not saying this is bad, this is good. That's I mean that would be an insane reading of the text. It's no, this is bad, and here's its source. Here's the fountainhead. The implication implicitly is this also is bad. It's the pregnant womb that gives birth to the, you know, to these yes. things. And so, so here you go. This is bad. This is its source, which implicitly is also bad. So make war here. Oh, but dot, dot, dot. By the way, I would like you to violently wage war, seeking to mortify that which is inherently permissible to God. What, mm-hmm. Like what kind of, I, you know, I'm not a, you know, a Greek scholar, but that seems like bad exegesis. It's definitely bad exegesis, and it, it's it it's sad. But it, even Douglas Moo gets this wrong. Robert Gagnon gets this wrong. I mean, those are both brilliant men, brilliant scholars in their particular expertise, you know. Right. But they they get this wrong, and um, it, it's sad because you know people they miss the metaphor. They miss the metaphor in James one, um, and the reason why I say that is because they say well. Only when desire conceives is it sin, but they don't turn around and also argue that only does sin produce death when it's full grown. No, they, they argue that sin always produces death, right? Mm, I mean, that right. that's right. Romans 3, right? right? Yeah. Or Romans 5. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's very clear, but 
but they they miss that metaphor. And mm. I, I usually ask people when they when they say, no, 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 James says it's not sin until desire conceives. I say, well, do you also believe that sin only produces death when it's full grown? And usually they'll they'll step back and say, well, no. And but that's a proof text. You know, people people are against proof texting until you start talking about this subject. Right. All right. Well, let's let's land the plane here because I think this is an interesting question. I've you know I, I've had a little bit of discourse with you and a couple of other guys offline about this topic, and so you know, same sex uh, attraction is an unnatural desire. Um, it's it's perverse. It's um, but you know, to play the devil's advocate, and I think I already know your answer, and I I agree with you. But to play the devil's advocate, what would you say to a single young man? So he's not married. Um, and he has heterosexual desires, um, but he desires uh, a woman. Is that also at the level of desire? Even, you know, he's, he's being celibate, he's not acting on it, but at the level of desire, um, if he desires a woman who is not yet his wife, um, is, is that also sin at the level of desire, inherently sinful? Well, it depends on how he desires her. So s- something I argue in my book, and um, as I argue that it is biblically permissible to desire a woman to cut a covenant with, a sexual covenant, one day. But if he is desiring her before that day sexually, then that that is sin. It's similar to, because if you argue from that it's natural to desire women sexually, then that would mean that it was permissible for even married men to desire other women sexually. I mean, we would have to argue that. Right. It'd be weird to say that this desire is not sin so long as you're single and that you could desire anyone, right? Because that's the problem is, okay, let's say you desire a particular woman because you're courting her or dating her, but then it doesn't work out and you end the relationship. And then now you're, you know, dating, courting another woman, you end up marrying her. Well, then retroactively, are we looking back now and saying, well, that first desire for that first woman who did not actually end up becoming my wife, that was sinful. But, you know, but that same desire pre-marriage with the second woman who I did actually marry, that was somehow not sinful, right? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. And mainly from Adam and Eve, the way, so God took Eve from Adam Adam was only attracted to one woman. I mean, if, if the fall did not happen, he would not have been attracted to multiple women. Um, and that's know, with them being me- naked in the garden. Right, right. <laughs> right. Which is so that's, wild. That is, um, that is a state of integrity right there. Amen. If amen. I've ever seen one. Yeah, yeah. And so we, it, it is good to love a woman. It is good to desire a woman, to desire to cut a sexual covenant with a woman. But to desire sexual immorality is sin. You know, from the, you know, it's the beginning of the lust of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And so we have to fight those desires. What I've told my my sons, my oldest son is 15. I told him when he has, you know, a desire that his body is telling him to get married according to God's design. Mm -hmm. And so he needs to pursue a wife. Um, But any, any sexual desire before marriage is sin, is what I tell him. And the reason why you you get it first uh, Timothy five, where Paul tells Timothy to treat all young women like sisters mm. and older women like mothers in all purity, and so if you view women that way before marriage, I mean you can you again you can love a woman and you can desire to marry her and cut a sexual covenant with her, um, but you cannot desire her as if she is your wife already. Mm-hmm. I got you. Yeah, and to treat you know women, uh, younger women like sisters, older women like mothers, um, it, seem, it seems again, it seems frivolous or wrongheaded to say this. It, the treating, lending towards behavior, this should be your uh, behavior as you engage um, other women, but behind the scenes, underneath your behavior, you could be uh, desiring them in a sexual way apart from a covenant. Um, that, yeah, seems, that seems weird. All right. Well, any yeah. any final thoughts? And then in this, please tell uh, the listener where they can go and get your book. Um, I'd like to just briefly talk about the temptation of Jesus, since his temptation is used so much to justify sin, which, uh, number one, 
the whole point of Jesus's temptation is not to send us running to the mirror; is to send us running to Him because He endured temptation perfectly. Right. But but yet people often say, "Well, I'm being tempted like Jesus, and thus I'm not sinning." Jesus's temptation in the wilderness was peculiar and unique because the devil offered him objectively good things offered through an evil means. So he offered him food. The text literally says Jesus was hungry because he fasted 40 days. So he's hungry. He has a desire for food. And so the devil tempts him with food, tempts him with angel protection, tempts him with the kingdoms of the world. All of those things are things that God had promised Jesus or would give Jesus during his earthly ministry or after the cross. They're all good things. But the devil, when he tempted for example, David, you know, it's not there in the text, but we assume he tempted David. He tempted him with laziness, murder, fornication, sexual morality, adultery. Um, so all of those are inherently evil things. Right. He, go, he goes to the true David and he offers him only good things. And Jesus immediately rejects the evil means. Right. He desired those things from his father. And so wanting to have sex with the man, if you're a man, is not you being tempted like Jesus. Right. <laughs> you know, it's right. not even close. Like, mm. that's an inherently evil desire. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if you are wanting to provide for your family and someone comes to you and says, look, I'll, I'll help you rob this bank. Mm -hmm. Right. Wanting to provide for your family is good. You reject the evil means, then you've been tempted like Jesus. Right. You haven't sinned. Right. And so so that's I just wanted to briefly talk about that because that is so misunderstood. Right. And uh, they, they also talk about Hebrews where Jesus was tempted in every way like us. But if you read the book of Hebrews, the whole point is that Jesus is better than us. Mm -hmm. He's the whole argument of Hebrews is that he's better than the Old Testament sacrifices. He's better than the Old Testament priests. He's right. better than the Old Testament prophets. Right. right. He's better he, than he's Moses, better. better than the angels. But yeah. Yes. Yes, he's better than all those who came before. That's why you don't need to return to the old covenant. And um, he is truly human like us, yet without sin is the point of Hebrews 4.15. Tempted in every way like us doesn't mean that he was tempted with murder or tempted with abuse or tempted like Jesus was not tempted with those things. He was tempted as truly human is the argument. It's an argument for him being our high priest in that chapter. And, uh, and so those, those are often used to try to justify sin, and we need to reject that. But, friend, you can get my book, listener, um, you can get my book at freegracepress.com. Right now they're, they're doing a pre-order special. It, it's just $14. It's $13.95, and um, it's endorsed by um, Rosaria Butterfield, James White, uh, Mark Coppinger, um, Mark Jones, and there's Great. several wonderful endorsements on there. And uh, I want to encourage you to check it out. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moore, for coming on the show. And yeah, listener, check out the book. It's, um, well, I mean, it's just a timeless biblical principle, but it's very relevant in our time today. And it's not to, uh, Jared is not trying to, uh, to leave the reader or the listener of this episode in a state of condemnation. It's not to say, so everything is sin, therefore feel bad. Um, is to say, well, everything is sin. Sin actually abounds a lot more than we like to say it does. Um, but that's God's grace abounds all the more. Um, and so it's not, Amen. so we're not making, you know, it might, sin, you might be tempted to say, well, it sounds like after listening to this, I, I already knew sin was a problem and now it seem, seems like sin is pervasive. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, that's right. Sin is pervasive and all the more the grace of God. Um, and not Amen. just the grace Praise to God cover sin, Jesus. but to war against sin and to war against yes. sin at the, at the, at the fountainhead, at the at the starting point. So yeah, and I want to I want to help people. So I was listening to S Sam Alberry the other day, for example, and he 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 was speaking at in uh, it was in Idaho, and he said that he would love to be a father, would love to be a father, but he can't marry because he has same sex attraction. Yeah, that's and sad. I just I'm like Sam, one day you're going to wake up. And realize that you forfeited God's good gift of marriage and children, mm -hmm. right? And that's I want to encourage people who have these desires to reject them and to cultivate desires that are in lockstep with God's design. Find the godliest opposite sex person you can find who's single 
pursue him or her for marriage and get married and have a lot of babies. Right. (laughs) Right. Yep. I hear you. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on uh, the show and thank you to the listener for tuning in. God bless. Joe, thank you for having me, brother. Our sponsors, Private Family Banking Partners, is on a mission to help Christians live out the Dominion mandate by making a stealth-like move away from the mainstream banks and into their own privatized banking system. This innovative system is designed to guarantee uninterrupted compound interest and tax-free growth without exposure to typical stock market risk. To join this growing community that is already building wealth unto future generations and converting post-mill talk into post-mill action, contact Private Family Banking Partner Chuck DeLaterante at his email chuck at privatefamilybanking.com. That's chuck at privatefamilybanking.com. Set up an appointment and receive a free copy of Chuck's new book, Protect Your Money Now, How to Build Multi-Generational Wealth Outside of Wall Street and Avoid the Coming Banking Meltdown. Go to the links in the show notes below. Are you a small business owner and desire to defer a larger amount of your business income? Find out how to defer more income taxes, in some cases up to 10 times more than you can with your current 401k plan or other retirement plans. Are you trying to acquire or sell a business but getting enough cash together for the transaction is the sticking point to closing the deal? then please contact our sponsor, Defined Benefit Partners. They will provide a free analysis of what may be possible for your business or the business that you want to buy or sell. See their contact information in the show notes below. 